Top Med Talk. Welcome to Top Med Talk at Palm 22 for our live session during the meeting, Top Med Talk Talks to. Today we have a very special guest, Dr. Alex Oliver, and he is going to be starting off with a little presentation for us, and then we're going to sit down and have a conversation with him in just a minute. Can everyone please welcome Alex to the stage? Great. Thanks very much, Desi. Thank you, Monty, for inviting me to talk. My name's Alex Oliver. I work at the Royal Marsden. I've been using this routinely for probably the last 15 years, and I thought I'd come and share my experiences with you today so that we can have a chat about some of the myths about it as well, and maybe dispel some of the myths. EEG monitoring. I think we can all recognise that the raw EEG is extremely difficult to interpret. Yes, you might see some flat waves in them. You might see some delta waves. You might even recognise some alpha waves if you're really, really good. But that's never going to tell you that the patient's definitely asleep or definitely awake or not. German in 1994 and came across the spectral edge frequency, which means where 95% of your waves are below, your frequencies are below. And it is a useful determinant of anesthetic depth, probably not as sensitive as some of our algorithms nowadays. Auditory evoked potentials also then came along, but then it was the advent of algorithmic analysis with EEG, patient state index invented by Massimo, entropy, that people started to get into EEG monitoring and realize there might be something in it. Do we need it? NICE seemed to think so in 2014. NAP5 seemed to think so in, way back in 2014 as well. The Be Aware studies done in 2004 seem to make a case for it. I think it makes common sense because there's such a massive degree of patient variability that I see across my whole practice. To think that two patients are going to need exactly the same amount of anaesthetic all the time for a big case, if it's the same case and the same patient age, same physiology, it's just a myth. There will be variations. It's good for patients. One of the first papers I came across in 2005 when I started using it by Terry Monk in North Carolina. She showed a 1.25 increase in morbidity and mortality in her patients if the BIS was persistently below 45, and these were a thousand non-cardiac patients. EEG is more than a number. You don't want to just look at the BIS number. There's a whole wealth of information on that screen for you to take away and analyze, which will help you give a good anesthetic. And when you're just looking at the number, I say this to trainees all the time, it's a bit like looking at the ECG and just looking at the P wave. It's not going to give you very much more than that. And it's all related to what I call the triangle of anesthesia. You want to know your patient's asleep. You also want to know that your patient's well analgesed for when they wake up. And the EEG monitoring will give you feedback for both of those criteria. This is a sort of typical standalone BIS monitor that you can get from the company Medtronics. That's the sort of BIS number I don't want to see very often. You can see the trend going along the bottom and suddenly we've had a dip down to five. And you can see possibly on the, on the trace on the top right, there's a lot of flat EEG going on there, which isn't displayed on this monitor at the moment because the person using it hasn't bothered to put up any of the other numbers. The BIS number should be 40 to 60. It's a measure of anesthetic depth only. It won't tell you whether the patient's well analgesed or not, but if they're not well analgesed, your patient's probably going to start waking up. And you have to be careful with synergistic agents. For instance, Remy Fentanyl. If you're using lots and lots of Remy fentanyl to keep your anaesthetic nice and smooth, you've got to be aware that at some point in recovery, that Remy is going to wear off very quickly and your patient's then going to be in absolute agony. But you won't realize that because you've been using such a lot of it during the case to keep your anaesthetic depth nice and smooth. Signal quality index. On a lot of monitors, it will be displayed as a number or sometimes as five bars. You want a good signal quality of at least five bars. This looks at five parts of the EEG and puts it into its algorithm. If it can't see those five parts clearly, it's going to start making up numbers. EMG, very useful, I think, but often ignored. It's not just an interference number. It actually measures noxious stimuli. If I come up to you when you're in bed at night and I stab you with a sharp stick, you will frown. Your EMG will go up. If I keep stabbing you with a sharp stick, you'll keep frowning and you will start to wake up. And this is what I see a lot of people do with the best. They ignore all the other information then suddenly the BIS number will go up and they'll plug in loads more propofol or loads more volatile, which isn't actually a good analgesic agent. On some monitors, like some standalone monitors, you'll see it displayed as a numerical display and less than 30 on some monitors means normal artifacts. So if your EMG reading is 27, your patient's not feeling pain. You have to be careful with filtering on certain monitors. So for instance, the Massimo Z-Line filters out the EMG signal very, very well so that the patient state index number stays and is reliable. However, because it's so filtered out, you, don't, you then don't get any feedback about your noxious stimuli response. They have now been able to change the software so you can take off that EMG filtering if you want to. 
And you have to be very careful with EMG monitoring with your interference. Even if you have the bear hugger flapping about by the forehead, the BIS monitor is going to pick that up as some EMG interference and you're going to start seeing your bar moving up and down. And you're going to think, oh gosh, is my patient feeling something? It's just a bit of flapping about on the forehead, by either the bear hugger or the surgeon's touching the face or a drape being moved across it. So be careful of that. Spectral edge frequency. I always have this up on display when I'm using my BIS because I think it's a secondary variable which gives me reassurance that the patient is asleep. It's the number that 95% of your frequencies are below. At the moment, I would hope that all of you are in the gamma range. Everyone's wide awake and concentrating very hard. So greater than 35 hertz. You then go down to the beta range where you're still very alert and aware. And then into the nice relaxed alpha phase where your brain is very, very relaxed, optimized, and it's a good place to be, an alpha range. Then the lower theta and then the whole below delta waves where you're deeply comatose and very, very deeply asleep. And that's probably not so good for you. What I find is if I keep my spectral edge frequency in the 10 to 20 hertz range, that usually corresponds to a good BIS. What's good about the spectral edge frequency is it's a real number. So if my BIS number is being interfered with by surgeons, for instance, doing lots and lots of diet therapy and decreasing my signal quality, and I'm wondering if the BIS number is guessing a bit because it's suddenly jumped from 40 to 65, but my spectral edge frequency, for instance, has stayed at 15 hertz, I believe my spectral edge frequency. Nothing has changed. There's just a bit of interference going on. I've lost three bars on the signal quality. I'm reassured nothing's changed. My patient's still deeply asleep. So this is an example of a BIS monitor reading from an elderly patient. So the BIS is fairly good, 41. You can see we've got five strong bars of, of signal quality. You can see this is a single-sided monitor. So we've got spectral edge frequency of 17 on the left side, which is actually quite high teens. It's usually low teens, I find, when you've got the BIS in the right place. But interestingly as well, he's got a bit of suppression ratio, this patient, but he's elderly, so I'm not surprised by that. They have lower powered EEGs and they tend to get more suppression ratio. What I try and do is I get this as low as I can go. So if I can get it down to zero, I will, by letting the BIS climb a little bit. I'll let it go into the 50s if I need to. And I'm always keeping an eye on this as well. So that's nicely below 20. I'm happy he's fast asleep. <laughs> this is a young patient having a similar operation with a nice normal BIS of 53. Again, good signal quality. Suppression ratio zero, very good. So that's a nice healthy EEG going along, no flat EEG. And the spectral edge frequency reading 14, just in the right place. So again, if a lot of diaphragm is happening and this starts to decrease, I get a low signal quality. And this might start to guess if that's the case because it can't do the algorithm properly. I go back to this. Has this stayed at 14, 15? I know the patient's staying asleep. I'm not worried. And importantly, I know that this chap's epidural is working very well when his tummy is wide open because I've got no EMG response whatsoever. So this patient's not feeling any pain and he's on a very, very low dose of remifentanil. Another good monitor is the Massimo headline. I think it works fairly well. It gives you spectral edge frequency, it gives you EMG, it's a bilateral monitor. I've used it quite a few times and it does work well. And like I say, you can now take off the EMG filtering if you want to. Entropy, I don't think it does work so well. I won't say any more about that. Narcotrend. <laughs> Narcotrend, I've used a few times and it, it works well. It gives you this banding of A to F with E being sort of nicely fast asleep. And, and in my experience, it does seem to work very well, fairly well, but I don't have massive experience. I probably can count less than five times when I've used it. Bilateral BIS we started to use at the Marsden because we actually used to put two single BISs on our patients when we were doing very long cases that would steeply head down sometimes. We were a bit worried if they were going to be okay. And we noticed with the single BIS is that sometimes one side would be reading 5 and the other side might be reading 45. And we thought, that can't be good for the patient, surely. And sure enough, if we corrected the cerebral perfusion pressure a bit, getting rid of the head down tilt, increasing the blood pressure, it became symmetrical again. So we got some bilateral sensors. And um, I've never had another asymmetrical patient since I've been using these. So we've gone back to using the single ones now. And... Um, we can now put spectral edge frequency on the single sensors. So it seems to be just as valuable. So what is BIS? This is a quote from Open Anesthesia many, many years ago when I started using BIS. And I was very intrigued by the fact that they thought EMG was useful and an interesting utility that should be used by everyone. And it was a BIS response relationship with IV or inhalational agents related to the BIS number. So because I was interested in EMG, I thought I'd also try another interesting machine called the null monitor, nociceptive level monitor. And I thought I'd do a little trial on a few patients and see 
whether notice reception on this monitor, which is a little pulse oximeter looking probe, which measures five different variables, including skin conductance and acceler an accelerometer and things. And if the number goes above 25 consistently, then your patient's feeling pain. So I thought, would this correlate with my this EMG number? So this is a breast case, and this patient's at the moment fast asleep. We've been going for a while, and the null monitor is saying less than 25. Patient's not feeling any pain, and it seems to correspond to a reasonably good BIS reading, and there's no EMG movement. So I'm happy that the patient's not feeling pain. Then they start delving into the axilla, and I see this happening. So the sharp stick has started to be applied, and the patient is starting to wake up. And that corresponded to my null monitor also going up. So I was quite happy that there's some correspondence, and I did this on quite a few patients and always got the same responses. So I was quite happy that the EMG was a good monitor, therefore, for picking up nose reception as well, and not just stimuli. There's a few good papers out there. Terry Monk did another paper in 2010 showing increased mortality after two years after the Be Aware study if your BIS was very low or if you're in the wrong group. Delirium's been looked at several times. But the thing about EEG monitoring is you have to use it. You can't just expect to know how to use it because you've read about it or you've got lots and lots of qualifications in anesthesia. It takes a bit of getting used to, and it's a bit like riding a bike. You can't just read how to use it. It's more than one number, and if you put all that information together, you'll get good awakening, good analgesia, and happy patients with good outcomes. After today, I hope you're going to be encouraged to be good at super at EEG. Thank you. So Top Med Talk is here, EPHOM 2022. I'm Desiree Chapel, your host. I'm joined by Monty Myvin. Thank you so much for joining me, Monty. It's, it's good to be here. It's <laughs> it is good to be Welcome here. Welcome to UCL. Welcome to UCL. It's been a great meeting so far. Properly introducing our guest today, Dr. Alex Oliver from the Royal Marsden here in London. Alex, thank you so much for that great presentation thank on you. processed EEG. We're going to dive down into it. You did a great job about getting into definitely some things that I've been using biz for a very long time and I heard some new stuff so that was very very interesting for our guests everyone here and everyone listening at home tell us just a little bit more about yourself your work there at the Royal Marsden and maybe just a little bit about your hospital for those that don't know the Royal Marsden is a, a tertiary cancer referral center it's been around since 1850 1851 but I've been a consultant there for 20 years and I was very lucky about 15 16 years ago when a colleague came up to me and said Alex I needed a good technique to help me with my jet ventilation during my head and neck cases. And these TCI pumps have just come out. What do you think of those? I'd done a bit of total intravenous anesthesia during my training, saw some benefit in it, thought it might be a good way to go. We got TCI pumps, and then the rest is history. We're now a, you know, a center that uses TCI all the time. And TCI, for those that may not... Target-controlled infusions, total intravenous anesthesia, so no gas whatsoever. Um, I then quickly realized when I started getting a few snags straight away that I was going to be worried about my patients that were paralyzed if I didn't realize those snags were happening. And I thought, I need an EEG monitor that's going to reliably reassure me that the patient is constantly asleep. And that's when I started using this probably a year later. And I tried other monitors as well, but this always seems to be fairly reliable. I've said that over the years. So for me, it's the most reliable. And easiest trends to predict what's going on. And the patients that you take care of there at the Royal Marsden, what does your patient population look like and who are you typically using this on? So for the last 15 years, I'd probably mainly be doing major lower, lower GI colorectal, some very big long cases sometimes with the sacrectomies, etc. So they're 12, 16 hour cases. And I, I thought the best cases to learn TCI and BIS on were actually the more intermediate cases, okay. like your day case patients, or like, for instance, your breast case patients where you want your patients to go to sleep nicely, be well analgesed, wake up well, go home the same day or the next day without any problems. And what, what a percentage of cases, I, I might have missed this, that are, you're actually doing TV, but the TCI TIVA? Everybody. Every single one? Every single case and every single case. So you don't give any sort gas at all no. anymore? Unless I have to do a gas induction, but then they flip them to the TIVA. Then you go straight to the TIVA. That's very interesting. So um, over the years... Has your practice using BIS um, and process EEG changed? I mean, what is that? How has that evolved? I think at first it started off as just being looking at the BIS number, and then I quickly realized that it, it was more than that, and to, to look at all the other numbers as well, to put the whole picture together. And like I, like I said in the triangle, it's about getting a patient well analgesic as well as well anesthetized. I have used BIS with gas anesthetics when I've had to give gas. Mm -hmm. I've always been quite surprised 
how little gas I need to give to mm. keep the patient to see. Yeah, absolutely. Do you have a question okay. already? It relates to using processed EEG and BIS in particular and the use of ketamine mm. and whether certain drugs, I'm guessing for that, I'm going to expand on it, modify your ability to interpret. Yes, it does. One of my colleagues does use ketamine quite a lot at the Marsden. Brilliant analgesic component, and she still gets her patients to wake up really well, but we know we have to kind of ignore the BIS numbers at the beginning. It does cause some crazy BIS numbers. It interferes with the algorithm. Were there any other challenges that you feel like using... I think it makes you aware, for instance, I did a patient recently with a history of epilepsy that was you know, quite difficult to control and on quite a lot of medication for that. And it made me realize that if I hadn't had the BIS, I probably wouldn't have realized how great his anesthetic requirements were. Yeah. It would have been difficult to predict. But that's another, another example of patient variability that yeah. you won't realize until you start using it regularly. Yeah, it sounds like it having that tool on there. Oh, we do have a question. We're going to go to Ed in Newcastle. Could you comment on the use of DSA in your interpretation of processed EEG? I've been using for the last year and found it very helpful, except for the ketamine, which you just preferred to. Thank you, Ed in Newcastle. So yeah, the, the spectral array is, is effectively looking at spectral edge frequencies. So the spectrum array is gives you nice colors, but effectively you're looking at that number, the spectral edge frequency. And again, if it's between 10 and 20 hertz, you're probably mainly in the alpha region, mm -hmm. which is good. There'll be a tiny bit of beta there. There'll probably be quite a bit of delta there as well. But if you stick in that region, your patient's probably nicely asleep. And what you'll find is that when you then start drifting with abyss coming up, when you start to wake your patients up and abyss drifts into 60, 65, 70, you'll see your spectral edge frequency creeping above 20 and you know it's corresponding. Okay. And if that's happening during the case, you know you've got to do something about your anaesthetic depth. Yeah, change something. So, um, Neville Bailey, I'm from Australia. And I do use TIVA frequently and I will always use a bis monitor. But a point that's often brought up by my, the registrars is, is the paper that goes back to 2015 British Journal of Anesthesia, and uh, it's your comment on this, and they, they paralyzed 10 individuals, succinthonium and rocuronium, and they found a large number of those. They were awake, so these were volunteers, I suspect, anesthetic registrars, but they were, they were paralyzed and awake, and their biz commonly went below 60. So in the range that you'd identify as being an exercise, would you comment, please? I remember that paper. Um, and I remember David Green talking about that paper from King's as well afterwards. And I think the problem is it wasn't really a true clinical setting. It may have been true what happened, and I, I'm sure it was, but I think it doesn't really relate to a true clinical setting. And I think you have to put it in context with the thousands of papers that have been published on this that have shown you its benefit. We have a, a, an online question. Would you recommend processed EEG for volatiles and TIVA? Yes, definitely. And I think yeah. th these studies by people like Terry Monk show that if we give patients too much anesthesia, and Tony Epsilon hit on this point once at one of the SIVA conferences, anesthetic drugs are filthy drugs. Volatiles are probably even more filthy than intravenous ones, let's be honest. But if we're dampening down the brain, we're probably dampening down lots of other important systems as well that we may not even understand yet. And what's the common sense in doing that? So I think the points that Terry Monk hits upon with her studies that showed she showed an increase in mortality even two years afterwards in the wrong BIS group in the, in the Be Aware study. That must be significant. And I think there's no common sense reason to keep somebody's BIS at five. Keep it in the right range. And you'll see it clinically afterwards, not just as soon as they wake up. You'll see them the next day and the day after that. They look a lot better and they're more ready to recover. So I know Guy Ludbrook's got a question as well, which he's kindly submitted online, but we're going to give you a microphone for it, Guy, if that's okay. <laughs> uh, Guy Ludbrook from Australia. Look, I think my question's sort of been asked, really, but there was a lot of fuss about the paper on paralysis. There was an earlier paper some, I think, 10 years before, describing the same phenomenon, actually. But I just have to say I agree with your comments. It's a very atypical, it's not a clinical scenario that you would ever get into in reality. But my memory is that EMP was quite a good depth of anesthesia monitor many, many decades ago in itself, actually. So what was, sorry? EMG in itself was actually very good. was used as a depth of anesthesia monitor before my time. <laughs> and I think it might have even been used in closed-loop anesthesia many decades ago. I think EMG is just an electromyographic response. So I think for measuring depth, I don't think it would be so reliable because even when somebody's really, really deeply anaesthetized and they have noxious stimuli, you will still get an EMG response. 
but they will be fast asleep. If you do nothing about that EMG response, the patient will start to lighten because they're feeling pain. I have another online question. Biz has an element of lag. Do you think it would be better not to be displayed continuously like heart rate and SATs? In other words, recognize the lag. It does have a lag. I think all the EG monitors have a lag. But I think, as I said earlier, I think the BIS trends fairly well. And you can generally tell what's happening when you get used to using it. But there will be a lag. But you will see that lag. And you will recognize it's happening when you get used to using it. Any other questions? Anybody up in the room? We have a couple more. Do we have a couple more? We do. At my trust, TVA is now basically the default choice. Most colleagues spend a long time trying to get the sensor check to mm. pass. Any tips? Always clean the head with a bit of alcohol. There's an interesting challenge. I, <laughs> yes. Always do an alcohol swab first. Um, test the, the sensors on the sides rather than right in the middle. If all else fails, was change the sensor. But I must admit, that's not something that we commonly encounter. Some of the challenges are, you know, sweaty foreheads, you know, all those things. The alcohol um, swab normally takes care of that. Yeah. Okay. We always alcohol swab. Yeah, alcohol. And someone had said something about maybe rubbing just a little bit at the sensor site. Is that something that you found help? I've never done it. No. <laughs> never <laughs> I had neither, but. We'll try and take these last three and one more from the room if anyone wants one. Do you think we need to use processed EEG in non-paralyzed, spontaneously breathing patients. Surely they will move if they are light and breathe up. That's true, but you're then a bit late. And the problem with that is, depending on the surgery that's happening, if they move at the wrong point and the surgeon's dissecting something rather fragile, it'll be a bit cross with you. And why wait until that point? Put it on, make sure your patient's not too asleep, make sure they're in the right zone, make sure they're well analgesed. They'll be easier to wake up. It'll make the whole process far easier and efficient. Got another online tip. Adding a drop of normal saline to the biz electrodes helps improving signal. Do that. Good for you. <laughs> <laughs> it's not for me. <laughs> Here's from Claire. Do you have a feel on how the EEG differs in patients with a neurological injury or dementia? In general, the elderly, especially the very elderly, you see a much lower powered EEG and you see a lot more burst suppression right from the off. So you might put someone to sleep, you've got them very, very smooth and steady with a bis of 45, all the numbers are good, blood pressure is good, very stable, but you can't get rid of the suppression of the 5 or 10%. And like I said on my slides, just try and go as low as you can go because the early work that Terry Monk showed with bis numbers, etc., that's probably related to how much suppression you've got on board. So if you've got a patient with a bis of five and probably, I don't know, 70% suppression, that can't be good for them. 70% of their EEG is flat. Mm -hmm. If you can lower that to as, as much as possible, so effectively you're doing the least damage, if you like, as possible, that must be healthier for the patient. But I don't think there's any good research out there on that. As someone who uses bis for every case, I'm about to move to a trust which uses <laughs> entropy rather than bis. Any advice? Make a business case. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, entropy is just far more unreliable. And I think that's just down to the algorithm. I can't put it down to anything else. It's, it's just extremely unreliable. Yeah. And it's disappointing to use. Okay, I'm going to definitely make these the last two quick ones. Have you observed any remarkable conflicts with any of the other hemodynamic parameters of which we should be aware as we're utilizing biz? So you mentioned, for example, the blood pressure. and Yes. Yeah. So you mean, does it help with... I'm interpreting it as any conflicts from the point of view of... You know, it's, it's a complex mix of yeah. physiology that's involved in depth of anesthesia combined with then hemodynamic responses, et cetera, et cetera. I think, I'm interpreting that. So I think it makes you give a more stable anesthetic. I think your BIS response, for instance, of someone that you think may be experiencing pain will be quicker than, for instance, their heart rate going up or their blood pressure going up. And I think that's actually an extremely late sign. And that's probably just before your patient's about to jump off the table. So you have to hit it earlier. I think getting the bis in the right place means you're probably giving the right amount of anesthetic. And with intravenous or volatile anesthetics, it probably means you're not going to give too much, which is going to help you give a more stable anesthetic as well. You will be surprised in the elderly how little you need to give sometimes. So I'm going to bundle these very final two together and then we're going to turn off Slido so we can go end the session. Not that people don't want to carry on talking. How do you cope with electrode placement for surgery on the head and neck? And any considerations in utilizing EEG in emergency elective surgery? First, or elective surgery. Or elective surgery, I'll tell you that. Okay, so head and neck surgery is a good question. And sometimes 
you just can't have it on because yeah. it's going to, the surgeon's going to be touching it all the time or it's going to be in their way if they're operating around that region. But what I do do now is I always put it on at the beginning. Mm-hmm. I take the patient into theatre and I get my baseline numbers. And are those numbers where I think they should be? Or have I, for instance, taken the patient in, I've given them what I think is the right amount of anesthetic and I'm quite surprised how high the BIS number is, so I'm going to have to up things a little bit. The surgeon may t- then take off the centre, he obviously asks first, hopefully. And, um, <laughs> and then I know I need to up things. So for instance, if someone's having a fairly intermediate facial surgery or something like that, and I know they're not going to need loads of analgesia, I might then run my propofol at probably double what I would normally and run my remy quite high as well to make sure I'm not missing any noxious stimuli. Now I know that's going to flatten their bits a little bit, and I know I'm probably going to cause a bit of burst suppression with that, but at least I'm pretty sure my patient's going to be fast asleep because I know those BIS numbers are telling. Because when I brought them into theatre, the BIS numbers were what I expected to see with the doses I was given. So I always put it on at the beginning and then take it off halfway through. And the second question, sorry, Monty. You I bundled the, uh, the second one was emergency surgery. So I do rapid sequence inductions with the BIS on. Okay. So you put uh, everything on before yeah. it goes to sleep. All right. Well, thank you so much for your slider questions. Um, if you have any other questions later on, we can maybe get to those right at the end. You know, one of the, qu- the questions and that we hear a lot, we've talked a, a lot about process EEG and different types of monitors and things like that. And, you know, pushback from different providers is usually, well, it's just a number. It's, you know, generates randomly, whatever that means. So when you are teaching, you know, up and coming doctors and um, other types of providers, what is it that you tell them whenever they can say that to you? I teach them to look at the whole monitor and all the numbers coming up and to make it, like I said, it's not just like looking at the P waves, you've got to put it, all the information yeah. together. So is your BIS number in the right place and is your BIS number reliable? Have you got a good signal quality index? Okay, I have got a good signal quality index. My BIS number is saying 45, I'm happy it's correct. Okay, good. That's borne out as well and reassured by the fact that my specialist frequency number is, for instance, 15 hertz. So I know that 95% of my waves are below 15 hertz. My patient should be fairly asleep. I've got no EMG response, so that means I've given so far enough analgesia or hopefully my epidural is working or my spinal is working. You put all the numbers together, I've got no suppression ratio, I've got a nice healthy EEG. If I've got 5% suppression ratio with a BIS of 38, maybe I can push the BIS up a little bit and get rid of that suppression ratio. I put all the numbers together and I keep looking at it. If I see the EMG moving, during my case, which may be an intermediate case, say we're doing breast surgery or something like that. And I've given so far 100 of fentanyl, I'm on three of Remy, which is a, a tiny dose of Remy, but enough to keep them LMA tolerant, laryngeal mask tolerant, or, or endotracheal tube tolerant, and ventilator tolerant. If I see the EMG bouncing up, of course I'm going to react to that, I'm going to turn my Remy right up, and I'll turn it up quite a bit, so I get rid of that noxious stimuli. EMG goes away, BIS stays nice and smooth, stays at 45. Great, I've got the analgesia under control with Remy. And maybe my Remy, Remy's running at 8 now. I then whack in a bit more fentanyl. Maybe give another two or 300 of fentanyl. Let it circulate. Bring the Remy back down to 3. If I then don't get an EMG response still, I know that my fentanyl has bounced onto those opiate receptors, that the Remy fentanyl has come off. And my patient is still well analgesed. And it's going to remain well analgesed when we're coming off and we're closing now. So that's the sort of way that I use the BIS to guide me. And obviously I turn things down towards the end to get the patient waking up at the end. One more question just to, to go on to that, uh, piggyback onto that is with the EMG and we know that there's a slight delay, what is the delay usually on that? Because you know, one of the things that we see is that, or I see personally when I'm doing anesthesia, watching your BIS, everything's going along just fine. Um, start to notice maybe a little EMG and the surgeon then yells like the patient's waking up, which that's what they always say. Uh, <laughs> not, not that they're moving and, you know, it's okay. But uh, so, I mean, how do you deal with that? Is that something that you see or is there indications and things that we can look for a little bit sooner? So I think EMG is fairly quick is to respond. Okay. I think when you're using TCI, remember as well, propofol does not block the involuntary spinal receptors. Volatiles do. So that means that if a patient feels something they don't like, they'll get an involuntary reflex and they'll move. The BIS will still be 45. They're not waking up, so you can reassure the surgeon. With volatiles, you won't get that because your spinal receptors are blocked by the, by the filthy agents. Um, you know, just block everything. So that's one thing to say. 
So in TCI, you're more likely to see that response if you haven't got enough analgesia on board. If, however, you run the REMI high, or you give plenty of fentanyl, you give plenty of analgesia preempting what's got about to happen, then you should get rid of that, that involuntary spinal response. Or you see the EMG rising straight away, jump on it. And remember, if your EMG is a n number, if it's 31, your patient's feeling pain. If it's 41, they're feeling a hell of a lot of pain because that's a logarithmic scale. Well, in closing, just asking, you know, anesthesia is diving into a lot different spaces out of the OR, sedation, yeah. heavy, heavy sedation, different types of cardiac suites, endoscopy, things like that. Where do you see the future of uh, process EEG in those types of spaces? And is there anything else we should look at? Look at? I know you're an anesthetist, so I see is not <laughs> where you primarily live, but are there indications for using it in other places? I think sedation is a difficult one because where's good sedation? Is it 80? Is it 75? Is it, who knows? And actually sedation, you're probably going to get feedback from the patient whether you've got it right or not. Where do I see EEG going? I, I think it will have a place on intensive care units, I hope, in the future and making sure patients are in the right place most of the time up there. I think I'm hoping in the future it becomes like a standard monitor. I think it's a good thing. And I think we should all be looking at it and reassuring our patients that we've got this on and that they're not going to wake up during the case and they're not going to be too asleep during the case as well. So I, I would hope eventually it becomes like a standardized monitor. Also from the hemodynamic management perspective, I'm a bit more of a hemodynamic geek. And therefore, it's, you know, if depth of anesthesia is contributing to the hypotension that you're now going to get clever about managing, when you maybe just yeah. did a different level of anesthesia, it seems as though we have to triangulate sort of that. Yeah, I mean, that's interesting, Monty, because yeah. with some of the really, really big cases, mm. you sort of see maybe halfway in, you know, six, seven hours down the line, you need much less anesthesia. Yeah. Yeah. And they're, they're staying hemodynamically stable. Everything's looking good. The gases are good. Metabolically, they look good. They just don't need so much. And you're turning your propofol levels down to unbelievably low numbers. As opposed to starting a noradrenaline or norepinephrine infusion. Oh, you might be on that already. But, uh, yeah, but you know, then it's, go it's going yeah. up. Yes. Yeah. When this yes. should be going down, yes. possibly. Yeah, exactly. Yet to be deterred. And I'm not exactly sure why that is. Yeah. And I think it's always been thought of, of using biz to go deeper, not like lightning. Exactly. Like, lightened up my anesthetic because I'm yeah. sure that, oh, I need to always be thinking that it might be enough. Yeah, and keep them well analgesic as well. Right, absolutely. Well, thank you so much. Alex, it was a, a great presentation, and wonderful com uh, conversation today. We really appreciate you taking the time Thanks for to me. join us. Um, Monty, wrapping up another round of Top Med Talk Talks 2. We cannot do this without the generosity of our sponsors, Cameron. No, 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 indeed. So extremely grateful to Medtronic for their support, along with all of our other sponsors. But without that, we can't keep the free open access medical education going to those thousands of people who listen around the world. So thank you very much, indeed, for your generous sponsorship. And to all of our other sponsors, but today is Medtronic Day. That's right. And thanks to you guys for sticking around for our session today. And everyone listening at home, we really appreciate it. If you missed the previous part of this, whenever Alex is giving his presentation, that will be on top on uh, excuse me the live.fpom.org site. Everything that we do will be on there after the meeting's well over. So if you're if you've joined up to watch, you can watch the whole meeting and our previous meetings. Yeah. For years to come, we hope. <laughs> Hopefully, <laughs> but, I'll the, stay on. And probably. the podcast will come out with the passage of time, so they'll be there too. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much for listening. Cheers. Thank you. Thanks for downloading Top Med Talk. Don't forget to subscribe via your podcatcher. Don't forget to check us out on social media. We're on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube. And also, don't forget, Top Med Talk is the broadcasting arm of EdPom, evidence-based perioptive medicine. We'd love you to find out more about that. If you check out ebpom.org, you can find low prices on some of the conferences we're organizing around the world. Many of them are virtual and don't even involve you leaving your own home. Check out ebpom.org now.